prolonged morning stiffness for greater than one hour involving hands and feet and severe fatigue. If she has a history of hypothyroidism well controlled on little grounds, Um, physical exam temperature is 98.2, EP 135 over 78, pulse 98, temperature rate 16, BMI is 32. Cardiopulmonary exam is normal, there's no rash. Musculoskeletal exam reveals tenderness and swelling of the second and third metacarbophalangeal joints by lateral. Elbows are stiff but have full range of motion without synovitis. There is sweet tenderness of the meta Charles of Blanchard joints bilaterally, CBC and global, um, RF negative, TSH 1.8, anti-CCP positive, IgG antibody against probably B19 positive, IgM antibody against probably B19 negative. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? What do you guys think? So it's not probably because um, if it was acute probably would be IgM, right? IgG just means you had it. Correct. Or, you know, you can have, you know, probably just parvo that already converted the IgM is wear enough and the IgG is remain. But the key thing with this question is the, the time criteria. And one of the teaching points is that when you, when you ask a rheumatology question, find out about the duration of the symptoms. Because for this type of symmetrical bilateral synovitis, that's the other thing that I teach students, just recognize if they're asking you if the physical exam description is consistent with synovitis because there's few things that give you synovitis like the inflammatory arthritis is one of them so here I, I put it in red because she clearly has like like swelling and tenderness that's consistent with synovitis and um, in osteoarthritis the findings may be different or you don't see an acute synovitis you may see it but you may you don't see it as often as with inflammatory rheumatology conditions but uh, I'll let you. I'll let you keep going. Remind me your name, Diana. What's your name again? Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. I'll let you keep going. So, what do you think is the right answer? Um. Well, I mean, it's involving the hands, right? Mm -hmm. So that would make me not really think of as much. I mean, hands you're gonna think RA or OA, right? So we're gonna RA is on there. So. Yeah, lupus. Lupus is like when you guys do infectious disease board review, is the great mimicker. Lupus can present with everything. In fact, I, I have a patient right now that. He was diagnosed with lupus after we did a renal biopsy because all the markers were negative and I biopsied his kidneys because I, I had no idea what he had. Mm -hmm. And he has ANA negative lupus, yeah. and, uh, which is very rare. It's only like less than 1% of the cases. But, but uh, yeah, lupus, you know, lupus can affect anything. When I was, when I was a resident, I remember um, they admitted a patient that his main concern, his ma main chief complaint was um, like skin uh, pruritus. He kept coming to the ER and the last time that he went in, they admitted him because he was having changes in his mental status. The family said like his personality is changing and everything. And it turned out that the guy had neuro, neuro, neurological manifestations of lupus, you know, personality change. And he had like on exam, he had a bunch of lymph nodes. It was a very educational case because I never, you know, like the take home message for you guys is like lupus is a great mimicker. It's a disease that sometimes it takes months or even years to diagnose and sometimes physicians don't even diagnose it it just goes unrecognized and unless they have one of the major involvement which is the two most se severe involvements for lupus is either when you have like cerebritis or when you have nephritis and those patients go into renal failure and then it's very dramatic because they can go remember we talked about the rpgn last time the rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis patients can go on dialysis very quickly if you fail to recognize that so, but yeah, lupus, lupus is possible. The difference on the boards for lupus is that if they give you an x-ray, they may tell you that x-ray showed non-erosive arthritis. That's the key. That's the difference between rheumatoid arthritis and lupus is that RA, um, it's, it's associated with erosion. And the erosion nowadays, we, you know, when I was in medical school, everything was in x-rays. Nowadays, rheumatologists, they send MRIs for the, of the joints because MRI is a lot more sensitive to pick up early erosion. So you're gonna, you're gonna see, I actually I think I should have a slide with that. But it sounds like this person has six weeks, some synovitis that is symmetrical. Another feature of rheumatoid arthritis that is very, pretty much consistent in every board question is that they tell you that the patients have stiffness, morning stiffness that can last up to 30 minutes or even 60 minutes. And that's very, in, in practice, you're always gonna ask that question, like, do you have any morning stiffness? 
Okay, so this person probably has rheumatoid arthritis. And um, there is, uh, the American College of Rheumatology has um, diagnostic criteria that involves at least, you need to have at least four or more for the diagnosis, but the question you should always ask your patient is, you have morning stiffness for more than an hour, swelling of the wrist, um, um, the met metacarpophalangeal joints, uh, or PIPs, and remember, osteoarthritis involves mostly the DIPs. Rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, they can involve the MCPs or the, the, um, the, the proximal interphalangeal joints. Um, and then, by nature, it's a symmetrical disease. I've seen rheumatoid arthritis with just one joint involved, but most, most patients with this condition, they have bilateral involvement. And um, the time criteria is very important. So, by definition, the, the, you have to have these symptoms for more than six weeks. And the reason being is that there are some viral conditions uh, that can present with arth arthritis, like synovitis, an exam, including hepatitis related hepatitis related related uh, um, uh, joint diseases like hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and even hepatitis C. Uh, have you guys heard about cryoglobulinemia or cryo? Have you heard about that? That condition is a very ominous complication of uh, hepatitis C. We'll talk about it. I have, I have a slide for that later. But um, and also parvovirus is actually a very common. So if you're in the urgent care and you get a patient like this, clearly has synovitis. In addition to throwing the typical ANA, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, one of the things that rheumatologists they always want to do is just give me an IgM for parvo or give me a hepatitis serology for the same reason. Okay? So, and the positive rheumatoid factor or the CCP, which is a lot more specific. The rheumatoid factor can be, there are some instances where it can be a false positive rheumatoid factor. So <clears throat> these are the typical deformities. I don't know if you guys still review these in detail, but when I was in medical school, they used to torture me with these deformities. But the swan neck deformity uh, in the distal um, joints and also the ulnar deviation, you know, from subluxation of, this, of, the, meta, of the MCP joints. And the, also the boutonniere deformity of the thumb. That's another classic feature. Um, but clinically, we always look into small joints. However, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease and you guys should always see it that way. The way to understand rheumatologic diseases now that we have a better understanding is that these diseases are not benign. And when you let them undiagnosed and untreated, they are associated with permanent joint damage. And also there is more and more research involving rheumatologic disease with cardiovascular outcomes. In fact, the most common cause of death of patients with rheumatoid arthritis is cardiovascular because these patients have um, elevated uh, inflammation and that carries a lot of like endothelial changes and these patients end up developing coronary, premature coronary artery disease and they actually die. I remember like yesterday when I was doing my fellowship at UCLA, I had a 32 year old lady with lupus status post cabbage. And you, you would think like, who's gonna get a cabbage at 32? Uh, a rheumatology patient would. So when you see these patients and you're actually providing primary care to this patient, always remember that the lipid and the cardiovascular risk factor assessment is very important. It's not just treating the joints, but it's also like, like how, what else can I do to help this patient? Okay. So these are the erosion. This is obviously pretty bad burned out um, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and in the, on your boards, they're gonna show you something like this. They're not gonna trick you. If you don't see erosion that is very, that, like I tell the students, like even the, the housekeeper can diagnose erosion there. But if you don't see any erosion, it's more likely lupus. If they're describing like a symmetrical joint and everything, and joint, joint involvement and everything. So in the labs we have, um, the standard of care now is the, uh, the CCP, it's more specific. You always wanna check ESR, CRP that are very non-specific. Um, you guys know what the ESR is or how they do the test? You guys know? So basically they take a drop of blood and they put it in a, in a very thin filament, it's like a little tube, and they, they drop it there and they let it rest for one hour. And what they measure is how, many, how much the erythrocytes actually dropped in that column. So if you're inflamed, you have a lot of um, inflammatory mediators in your blood. So the erythrocytes are actually gonna, gonna drop more than a person that is non-inflamed. 
you gotta be careful with this test because there's some other instances when you can get like, when you can get a false positive ESR. For instance, in pregnancy, because the blood is more diluted, so the erythrocytes are negatively charged and they're repelling each other. But when there's a lot of inflammation, those inflammatory mediators, they actually counteract with that um, repeal process because they're negatively charged and they precipitate. That's why we're able to measure inflammation. But one thing that we all agree in internal medicine is that if you have a lot of precipitation, like let's say an ESR greater than 100, there's only one thing that can give you that, which is a pretty severe inflammatory process. So if you if you get a 20, you're like, ah, whatever, you don't get very excited, but if you get like, for instance, you're ruling out PMR. You guys, have you guys heard about PMR? I'm gonna talk about PMR later, but PMR, those patients are so inflamed. They can't even stand up. You tell the patient with PMR to stand up from that chair, they're like crying when they stand up. And those patients have very high P ESR, like in the 80s. Or for instance, if you do urgent care, and let's say that somebody comes with an, ulcer, with an ulcer, like a, a toe ulceration, and you wanna make sure that you don't have any osteo. So one of the things that is very useful in the urgent care is that you do the x-ray, most of the times you can't get a read on the x-ray, but you're trying your best to, to see whether or not you see any you know, cortical bone involvement. But an ESR is a very helpful test because if an ESR is very positive, you're, you're, you're very likely dealing with osteomyelitis. And that's a complete different management than if you're just dealing with, with a toe ulceration. So ESR is a very useful test, but I want you guys to learn the limitations, how it's done and what are the limitations. So sometimes anemia is a false positive pregnancy and there's other two that I can, I can remember. But the bottom, line, the bottom line is that the higher, the more specific. You got it? Okay, so CRP is like the C-reactive protein. Um, also, that, that's a useful test in the urgent care because it can come stat, it can come within like probably 30 minutes. Um, these patients can, can actually, uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients can actually have thrombocytosis. Thrombocytosis and is, is seen in medicine as an, it's, a, it's like a, the platelets, the bone marrow start releasing more platelets when there's an inflammatory process. And many doctors consider the platelets like, a, like an inflammation reactant. And one of the things that you can actually look at the CBC. Um, MRI and ultrasound, they're using, using them more frequently because they're more sensitive. But as a general doctor, as a primary doctor, I never send it because it's kind of ridiculous. If I think that I need to do an MRI, you probably need to see a rheumatologist, you know, I'm just doing my, my plain films. All right, wait, somebody can help me with this one, please. So let me ask you a question. Remind me your name again? Maggie. Maggie? Maggie? Mm -hmm. Maggie. So we all concur that this person has pretty bad rheumatoid arthritis, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I gave you all the description of the physical exam. And when you see those, those keywords, you think about rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And she's going in for a pre-op. And I always ask the students when these rheumatology questions are so dense that by the end of the reading, you're like, oh my God, what, what, what is it that you want? <laughs> so my advice to you, when you're preparing your boards, try to read the question and then go back and read the whole thing. And then you're gonna read the question twice. Because when I was doing my boards, I always obviously felt very upset when I missed a question because I didn't understand exactly what, I, what they were asking me. So we all agree that she has burned out rheumatoid arthritis. 
and I gave you all the description, the physical exam description, and she's going for a pre-op. So what do you think is important for a person who's going to go under general anesthesia and has rheumatoid arthritis? That's what I'm asking you. Why? Well, you're going to be kind of going like this. Exactly. Exactly. And then this, this, this has happened many times, you know, like clinicians that are not experienced, like dealing with this patient population. And if you actually don't do a cervical spine x-ray, these patients can have cervical instability of the atlantoaxial articulation, and you can cause severe neurological damage or even death in patients. So when you are actually on the field, if you, for whatever reason, need to help a person with... Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you gotta be very careful with that maneuver of extending the neck because it, it can be it can be problematic. So I use this question not only to remind you about that because you need to know this if you're gonna be working in the urgent care setting, you need to know all these skills, but to remind you that rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease everywhere. Everywhere can get involved. The eye can cause uveitis, the heart can cause coronary disease, in the blood it can cause lymphoma, in patients, actually, that's the second most common cause of death on, on RA patients is lymphomas. In the joints, it can cause a lot of destruction. Um, in the skin, you can get like rheumatoid, the subcutaneous nodules. Um, you're going to see a lot of patients going in the urgent care. The eye complaints in the urgent care, guys, you got to be very smart about it because that's, that's when you get a lot of lawsuits. And if you work in, an, in a setting where you can actually call the ophthalmologist, please do so because the eye is a, it's a different world. I can't even understand or read the documentation from ophthalmologists myself. And I've been doing this for some time. Um, and one thing that I always tell the students, you ask the patient, you document not only visual acuity, but you also document whether or not there is pain in the eye because conjunctivitis, like a bacterial or viral conjunctivitis, does not give you pain. It gives you crusting and a red eye. But if the patient tells you, I have a lot of pain, I have photophobia, and there is decreased visual acuity, those patients, they need to be seen stat. I mean, that day or the next day, because they may be either having a scleritis or an episcleritis. And you, you also assess the, the pupillary reflexes, because when you have like episcleritis or like um, uveitis, your, your reflex may be a little sluggish. So, like in my experience, like a lot of the doctors, they, they, the patients go in with a red eye and everybody go, walks away with an antibiotic, which is obviously a very ingrained practice, but it's not very accurate because most of the times conjunctivitis is a viral process. So with or without treatment, it's going to go away. It's just for making the patients feel better, they send them with an antibiotic. But what I'm trying to say is don't, if the patient has eye pain, very red eye and photophobia, that's not conjunctivitis. That's actually, there's something else. So always remember those, the triad that can get you in trouble. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis patients can actually have a coexistent Sjogren's syndrome. You guys know Sjogren's? Have you heard about Sjogren's? Okay. Patients feel very dry, like serostomy and, you know, a lot of issues with uh, dry eyes. And mononeuritis multiplex. Do you guys know what that is? Mononeuritis multiplex. You're going to get a board question with a patient with mononeuritis multiplex. Do you know what that is? Okay. Okay. So always remember this. When you see this, it's a vasculitis until proven otherwise. Either a small vessel vasculitis, like an ANCA vasculitis, or even in rheumatoid arthritis. I've never seen it. I, I've only read it in the books. But the one I've seen is ANCA causing mononeuritis multiplex. So they're going to give you a vignette where the patient is actually feeling fine and they, sh they show up because they, they either have a, um, how do you call it, the drop wrist? Like a medial nerve involvement or a radial nerve involvement or like a peroneal nerve involvement and it's only an isolated nerve involvement. That's very rare and when you see that, you suspect uh, small vessel vasculitis until proven otherwise. So, give you an acute, acute peripheral nerve dysfunction, think about vasculitis. Always think about that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I missed that one. Yep. <laughs> I'm telling you. And I, I missed it too. I was like, I'm pretty sure I was like, yeah. 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 But that, I'm pretty sure, I'm convinced you're going to get this question on your board. So, mononeuritis multiplex. Okay? So, we, we all heard about Felty syndrome, which is, you know, the, the um, leukopenia, splenomegaly, and rheumatoid arthritis. 
those patients they they're at risk for overwhelming infection they have um, ineffective like immune system and they need to be treated differently like a like an immune suppressed patient um, and like I said coronary artery disease is the leading cause of death and I'm gonna throw you another pearl do you know what's the leading cause of death um, for kidney transplant patients or for liver transplant patients was the leading cause of death cardiovascular disease so always remember that and um, rheumatologic patients coronary disease as well okay all right somebody help me please First of all, what's the diagnosis? Yes, right. Why is the ANA positive? It's positive in multiple um, right. autoimmune disorders. Right. It's, it's one of those things that if you don't suspect this is autoimmune, don't order because you're going to be stuck. You don't know what the hell to do with that. So, but yeah, I agree with you. So, so what do you think is the next most appropriate treatment for this patient? How do you treat RA? In other words, What's the question is, how do you treat RA? I know methotrexate is a treatment for RA. You, would you give um, methotrexate to this patient? Does she have a contraindication for methotrexate? Let me take it to the next level. What are the contraindications for methotrexate? Alcohol. Alcohol, yeah. And she's unwilling to stop, so you're going to kill that lady <laughs> if you give it to her. So. Um, liver failure is another contraindication and kidney failure is another contraindication. It's really excreted so you can reach toxic levels fairly quickly. But the other thing that's important to understand in this question is that I, I told you that she has no erosions. So um, black vanilla is the old fashioned way of treating like um, rheumatologic diseases. Uh, but it's actually very effective for patients with just arthralgias just arthritis, she doesn't have erosions. When there is erosion, there's no question that she needs either methotrexate, and if you cannot do methotrexate, you're gonna have to go to Embryl, the etern, et, etern, I can't pronounce that, Eternsept, and, um, and increase ibuprofen dosage was what my wife's primary care doctor told her when I was dating her. She, she was having synovitis, and one time we were in a day like, oh, oh, my arthritis is back. Like, what do you mean my arthritis? Like, yeah, my doctor told me to take ibuprofen. Yeah, but what's the diagnosis? Like, no, she told me a little bit of arthritis. Like, yeah, but what the hell is a little bit of arthritis? And then it turned out she had rheumatoid arthritis for years and she was mismanaging her. So and she, she was actually, she, she was left with some damage. But you, you want to diagnose and you want to treat this disease. This is it's pretty aggressive with the joints. But the key thing here is that, um, okay. Okay, that's another question. If somebody can help me with that one. I'm at like a weird angle. Uh, okay, so 33 year old woman is, woman is evaluated during a follow up visit. She was di diagnosed with RA three months ago. At that time, she began methotrexate therapy and folic acid supplement. She also takes ibuprofen and Tylenol. Uh, despite this treatment, she has two to three hours of morning stiffness daily and wakes frequently during the night with pain and stiffness. She also has persistent pain in the hands and feet. On physical exam, vital signs are normal. Neck and shoulders are stiff but have full range of motion. Small nodules are present on the elbows. The right elbow has a small fusion and has 15 degrees of flexion contracture. The wrists and MCP joints are tender bilaterally. There is synovitis of the wrists. Um, the left knee has a small fusion. The MRP joints are also tender bilaterally. Labs show uh, <coughs> 
platelet, four, 460,000 uh, ESR is 45. Radiographs on the hand show periarticular osteopenia and erosions of the right ulnar styloid in the base of the left fifth metacarpal bone. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step for this patient? Sure. So this person has RA, right? Mm -hmm. She's already being treated and we're assuming she's compliant with methotrexate and she has significant symptoms and erosions on the x-ray. So what I'm asking you is what would you do next? What would be the next step in the management of this patient? That's the teaching point of this question. So hydroxychloroquine, plaquenil is very effective for pain but it's not, it's not gonna modify significantly the course of the disease. So this person is gonna continue to have worsening joint damage and probably permanent disability. Cyclophosphamide is not um, an FDA approved medication for rheumatoid arthritis. We use it for a variety of sim the, the rheumatologic diseases and nephro nephrology diseases, including lupus. Um, and methotrexate, uh, you, you, you don't want to stop it because this patient is actually in need of methotrexate. It's a very effective therapy, it's just it's not sufficient for, the, for her. And sulfasalazine is from the same family as the plaquenil. Is they fall into the DMAR, they work. They work very different, but it's a it's a DMARD uh, disease modifying agent. But in this at this point, like this person is a very good candidate to add, to add a biologic agent. So back in the I'm going to say probably the early 2000s, these medications were introduced, and they really transformed the the way we manage these rheumatologic diseases. These are monoclonal antibodies uh, against against. Uh, Different, different inflammatory mediators, so some of them are against TNF-alpha, some of them are against some of the interleukins, but they're very effective. So on your boards, they're going to they're gonna probably trick you to, um, number one is a stepwise approach. So in other words, you, you know, the, the, the way they do it, like you do NSAID steroids and then you do a DMARD, we don't use that because if you actually see that there is joint damage, you want to go straight for the more aggressive management, which is methotrexate, and if methotrexate doesn't do it, you add a biologic. And one of the things you should know is that you never prescribe, I never prescribe biologics, but on your boards, they're going to want to trick you, uh, so you, you answer this, but you always need to have a PPD or a quantiferon gold, because one of the side effects from Humira, Embryl, is that you get disseminated TB and you can kill the patients. Uh, so you need to have a negative PPD and you can accomplish that by, by a PPD or by doing a quantiferon gold. Okay? So another thing that's important is that um, patients that are on Plaquenil, Plaquenil can deposit in the eye. So if you have a patient on Plaquenil, it's a must-have. They need to have a yearly eye exam just to rule out the position uh, it can cause like a like irreversible uveitis, and it's something that is preventable by doing a yearly eye exam. The ophthalmologist can see it, whether or not the, it is accumulating. So we have the biologics and the non-biologics. From the bio, from the non-biologics, historically, when I was in medical school, we used to have gold, penicillin, like all sorts of like dinosaur drugs that we don't use them anymore. So rheumatology is actually treat patients with uh, non-erosive rheumatoid arthritis with either Plaquenil or they give them sulfasalazine or they even do methotrexate. Methotrexate is a weekly medication and patients usually start with a very low dose. They can actually take like, like something like 7.5 milligrams which is three pills once a week. I'm sorry, once a week. Um, the must have is that these patients they need to have baseline LFTs and they also need to have like every 12 weeks you need to have LFTs because this medication can be hepatotoxic and it's contraindicated in those patients drinking because you can cause like profound folate deficiency and one of the side effects from this medication is that you can cause profound um, leukopenia or one of the very inconvenient and painful side effects is that patients taking methotrexate they can develop like a very severe form of stomatitis it's like an aftose aft stomatitis it's not herpes related it's just severe folic, uh, folic acid deficiency and this patient is a very very painful condition so you always prescribe it along with folic acid every time you're you're treating these patients so so those are the three non-biologics that we use primarily and for biologics we have the three most most common ones are the the uh, Humira, Embryl 
and the other one inflicts him out. No, what's it called? No. No, what's the, if you guys have Hippocrates, you can look. I forget the names. But uh, Hemira inflicts him out, I think, is Remicade. Remicade, Remicade, Embril, and um, Humira are the three FDA approved, the TNL alpha blockers. Um, like five years ago, they came up with this IL interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. That stuff is like, it, it works like a, like a champ, you know. One of my best friends, she's a rheumatologist, and she tells me that the patients that are failing everything, that, that's just unbelievable. But that's a very expensive medication, and obviously it's, it's reserved for, for rheumatology. And less commonly used, that I don't even know if they're actually, um, they're rituximab, I don't know if it's FDA approved, I think it's off-label. Uh, rituximab is a CD20 um, monoclonal antibody that really transformed the way we manage lymphoma. You know, lymphoma is a curable disease nowadays. Lymphoma, even if you have stage 4 lymphoma, meaning that you have metastatic disease, um, it went from an incurable, always fatal disease to actually a uh, disease that can be cured. And rituximab is one of those amazing medications that were like, like, created in the, in the last 20 years. But it's also off-label for rheumatologic diseases. Some of them are lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and we have like a couple of the other ones, leflunamide. Leflunamide, I misspelled it. Leflunamide is also known as Araba. It's a very uh, effective medicine, but it can be quite hepatotoxic. Uh, when, I was working, um, when I was working at UCLA, there was a patient who was taking Araba and she was she had hyperlipidemia, so the doctor gave it simvastatin 80, and she ended up um, getting um, what was the other medicine they gave her? She was on deltaism, simvastatin, and 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 Arava. and the lady ended up uh, developing, you know, deltaism actually inhibits the cytochrome p450 so the level of the um, semvastatin was much higher and the patient went into fulmin and hepatic failure she didn't make it so um, it's one of those things that these medications are serious stuff uh, my advice to you if you guys go into primary care uh, i don't mess with them but be aware that they can potentially cause like both hepatic failure and rhabdomyolysis because they're metabolizing the liver so, again, like I said, plaquenil for milder disease, sulfasalazine for mild, milder disease, it can cause a lot of GI side effects. And in male, it can cause oligos, oligospermia. Um, and methotrexate is, is actually the mainstay therapy for rheumatoid arthritis for those patients that are able to tolerate it. My wife took it for three months and her hair started falling off and she hated it. She never took it again. But um, it's a tough medication because it has side effects. But you, you, need to rule for, you need to monitor for bone marrow suppression, pneumonitis, hepatotoxicity, and these patients need a lot of like surveillance. And liver disease or alcohol use is an absolute contraindication for the use of this medicine. So biologicals, we, um, we really transform the, the care for this patient. It's most beneficial when you combine them so you don't stop the methotrexate for the patient that you read. You, you do it in addition to methotrexate, and they work best that way. And the big complication is infection. Remember, you need to have a PPD. You need to have a quantiferin goal or a PPD before you start those patients. And you're never going to prescribe it, but they're going to ask you that question on your boards. And, you know, you can kill someone. I've seen two cases in my career of disseminated TB related to these medications. Okay, somebody needs to help me with this one, please. Scleritis, right? Remember, I told you in the urgent care, you hear this eye pain or photophobia. That's no good. You need to call a room, uh, an ophthalmologist, and the ball is in his court or her court. But always think about like, is this could this be a scleritis or a uveitis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So photophobia is present, and 
both people react to light and you made an re emergency referral to ophthalmology. And then following to a resolution of the eye problem, this patient should be evaluated by what f the following systemic diseases. What do you guys think? Mm-hmm. Ankylosis mm -hmm. spondylitis, right? Yeah, yes. And those are they fall into which category in the rheumatologic diseases? Zero negative. Yeah. So always get to get this. Um, and this is another question for zero negative. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna basically summarize it. So this person has basically like um, conjunctivitis, and he has some diarrhea and joint pains and when you saw the patient basically you saw synovitis in the ankle and which of the following is the most likely diagnosis if you have the sort of negative arthritis what do you guys think it is i told you have gi symptoms right it's reactive arthritis so they used to call it how do you used to call it I'm getting a guy who's a Nazi or something like that. I think they call it that way, but reactive arthritis. So when I was in medical school, there was no treatment for this condition. And it was actually very, it was pretty bad. The patients would suffer like from, you know, the bamboo spine and like the stiffness and progressive deformity. And they had a limited life expectancy. And another uh, feature of this, if they give you a uh, description of uh, the tendons, that's called enthesopathy. That's how, how, how the medical term. And... They have like all this extra articular involvement and sometimes there's an infectious trigger, sometimes it can happen out of the blue. Um, these are the more common ones, the four. Um, I highlighted in red the most important things, the high yield points. So I'm going to go over them for the sake of time. So for AES, the pain improves with exercise. So these patients, they wake up with a lot of pain and as the day, as they warm up, they feel better. They may show you a bamboo spine. I just show you the picture. I'm going to show it one more time. It looks like it looks like a bamboo, right? There's fusion and there is a lot of like cortical bone loss. And the treatment is DMARDs and biologics. And really these biologics really change the course of the disease. For reactive arthritis or, you know, the, the more commonly tested on your boards is riders where the patients have urethritis, conjunctivitis, and asymmetric arthritis and that's um, that's an important distinction with um, seropositive arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis where or lupus they like I said initially it may happen unilateral but most of the time is bilateral and the boards is always bilateral they, they're not gonna trick you and so these patients the, the treatment the treatment is you don't treat them with DMARDs or biologics you just treat whatever was the triggering. If you have an STD, you treat the STD. And these patients, or you have like, whatever, like a GI issue, you treat the GI issue and then the arthritis should go away. In other words, the activity, the disease activity, correlates with the, with the primary infection, site of infection. And then we have the enteropathic or arthropathy. I've never seen it, but it's always, I mean, I, I, I don't think they're gonna even ask you on the board, so I don't, I don't recall it, ever seeing it. But it's more like peripheral joint involvement, and these patients can actually have like a lot of like sacroiliitis, like patients complaining of hip pain. And the one that you're going to see probably in PETS, if you've done, have you done any PETS rotation yet? So we see psoriatic arthritis is common, in, most commonly seen in children, but you can see it in adults. And one of the key things on your boards is that. Patients with psoriatic arthritis, they have involvement of the distal interphalangeal joints. It's a common, commonly involved site. And we don't treat these patients with plaquenil because they actually, for whatever reason, plaquenil makes the psoriasis worst. So we treat these patients with biologics. Okay, somebody help me with this one. Um, erythrocyte segmentation rate is 15. 
uh, standing radio graph is shown. What's the most likely right process? What do you think? Just based on the description of it um, being relieved with rest and worse of activity, I would think osteo. And based on the age of the patient, and the occupation, and all those other things that you get, you got in the history. Yeah, so there's a lot of like, you know, subchondral sclerosis, and there's the space narrowing. So those are the things that you can very easily identify when you're working at the urgent care. Um, this is basically important that you distinguish inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. So for inflammatory, the patients have a lot of morning stiffness. They have systemic symptoms. The, if you if you do an, a diagnostic arthrocentesis, these patients have a lot of like like inflammatory cells, and you can either see erosions um, versus uh, osteophytes or subchondral stero uh, sclerosis that I was showing you. So this is basically a wear and tear type of problem, and we're all going to develop this at one point in our lives. Um, okay, so this person, just for the sake of time, this is a person with osteoarthritis that is coming in because she is already failing um, uh, Tylenol and um, what would be the next most important step in this patient if you're having a patient with bad osteoarthritis this is bread and butter you're gonna get this probably every day of your life if you end up going into primary care patients coming in with joint pain or knee pain they don't even they don't even they don't even they don't even correlate their pain with their weight, but your job is always to advise them to lose weight. You're going to be surprised how many times you tell them that and like, oh really? You're like, I was amazed, like, what do you think? But the, the, the next step in the management, if a patient is already like failing, like conservative management, what do you do? What do you tell your patients if they're going with, with a lot of like pain from osteoarthritis? What would you prescribe next? So would you do a lavage in the breathing, arthroscopic lavage in the breathing? Mm -hmm. So that's, they've done studies on that and that doesn't help at all. And there are doctors there that are still doing that because it's a procedure, but the reality is there's, that doesn't help in any way. So Celebrex and ibuprofen, the FDA recommends against the use of NSAIDs in the elderly. Mm -hmm. So this person is 67. I think after the age of 60, they, 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 they don't, it's not absolutely contraindicated, but they say use with caution. And the last thing you want to do is to give someone with um, 67 years old, you're going to tell them you start taking ibuprofen for years for the management of a problem that's not going to get better. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can tell your patients is you're going to be taking Tylenol around the clock unless they have liver failure. Mm -hmm. Taking liver, uh, Tylenol around the clock. And if Tylenol fails or if you're having a lot of pain, you can take a little bit of Tramadol once in a while. Tramadol is an opiate, and opiates have a lot of problems. And you guys know that it's the number one cause of death for adults from the age of 18 to, to 50 in the United States is prescription drug abuse. You guys have to be very careful with how you manage your practice. Some doctors, they don't care, and they start prescribing like candy. I'll tell you right now, if you're one of those doctors, you're going to eventually get so many of those patients that you're going to hate your life and you're going to hate your practice. So, in a patient with clear indication like this, you need to teach them that. You're going to combine um, Tylenol with a little bit of Tramadol and you're going to just give them a little bit at a time. Um, total knee arthroplasty is the treatment of choice, but it's reserved for those patients with severe, advanced, burned out knee osteoarthritis. You don't do it in a you know, person with, that are failing. Another thing, another tip that patients ask me about glucosamine and chondroitin. Some small studies that actually shows that it helps, it's not harmful in any way. So I tell them, go ahead and use it, it's not harmful. And another thing that I do commonly is that, especially in the elderly, there is a cream called capsaicin. Capsaicin is very Capsaicin is it's a little interesting drug that inhibits substance B, which is one of the mediators of pain. And the first time the patient uses it, they want to they wanna run to the emergency room because they feel that the knee is on fire but you need to warn them about that side effect and you use it. The other day I had a patient with shingles and I prescribed that for the knee and he got confused 
and he applied that to the shingles and the guy ended up in the ER. Um, so this made it really worse, like what made it really worse, the cream in my shingles, like <laughs> I can't even imagine, you already, you were already on fire, you put more fire. Um, but yeah, so tramadol is a FDA approved, recommended for So the typical thing is um, uh, physical therapy, weight loss, work simplifications, you know, assistive devices, you know, the, the common sense things. Injections, this is a skill that I want you guys to develop when you do your rotations. It's very effective and it gives a lot of patient satisfaction. So when a patient comes into my, to my practice, I just do it. If you want a little bit of a steroid, if they don't have a contraindication, like some control diabetes and control hypertension, if they're there and you want to help them, it is actually a very, very nice thing to do because they, they feel much better the next day, they're going to thank you. So the skill is very easy. Injecting the knee is very easy. I mean, anybody can do that. So. When you guys are doing your your rotation, I want you guys to develop that skill because it's going to help you a lot in your primary care practice. It's going to help you a lot. There's three things that you guys can learn how to do. Like the, the, um, uh, what's the name of the both person here? The subcromial prosthetic injection. Mm -hmm. Instant gratification. There's another thing called the um, trochanteric prosthetic. That stuff hurts like, like there's no tomorrow. And the patients don't get better even if you give them all these. And if you give them a little bit of, if the diagnosis is very simple, you just press there and they jump. And right there where the, where the bursa is, it's not a hip problem because they can perfectly move their hips. And, but if you press on the bursa and they jump out of the table, that's the diagnosis. And the treatment is the easiest thing. You just put a 1 ml of camelot and they're, they're going to love you for it. So, um, surgery again is when everything is exhausted. So this, um, this um, um, hyaluronic acid, and there's another bunch of like injectable stuff that they come up. They've done studies, and the benefit is no different than injecting cannula, and they're very expensive. So, um, and obviously you don't want to give a steroid if you suspect a septic arthritis because that's big kind of malpractice. You see, if you have a septic joint, that's an uh, orthopedic emergency. The patient needs to go that same day for the, to the OR for a washout, a joint washout. So if you have an acute synovitis, very angry, you don't inject steroids. You want to do a diagnostic arthrocentesis. I'm going to cover that in a minute. So in green, we have the more common involvement for RA, lupus and hemochromatosis. You guys know what hemochromatosis is? On your boards, they may give you an individual with um, joint pains, some sort of liver problems, bronze diabetes, that's how they call it because the deposition of iron is a genetic abnormality where you have a mutation, an autosomal recessive mutation of the, um, uh, I forget what the name of the gene is, but in other words, you have excessive amounts of iron deposition and these patients develop end organ damage, you develop cardiomyopathy, you can even develop renal failure from this, you can develop uh, diabetes because the iron deposition occupy the pancreas, killing the beta cells from the pancreas, and the patients develop, um, 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 we call it bronze diabetes because the color of the skin changes when these patients have um, deposition in the skin. And, um, but in the, this, in the red one, uh, osteoarthritis, you know, the Heberden nodules, you really need to remember those. And remember I told you that one of the high yield uh, things to memorize is that D DIP is psoriatic arthritis or osteoarthritis. Always remember those two, okay? And then we have the Bichard nodules, nodules and the, the proximal, and I'm sorry, the, the distal interphalangeal joints. I'm sorry, the why am I blanking up? NCPs. Um, PIPs. These are the PIPs. The PIPs, um, you have the rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Okay, so let me see if this is very useful. You guys read the whole thing. Okay, yeah, why don't you read? This is a useful one. Why don't you tell me you guys read the question? Any takers? Oh, 
year old woman is evaluated for forty history of swelling and pain of left ankle. She has a six year history of Crohn's associated with joint involvement of knees and ankles. Her last one was two years ago. At that time, she was treated for three month course of two with the three month course of two different pregnancy and Zimab. She has continued on the Zimab as a fire pain for three years. A physical exam, temp is uh, 100.5, pulse 88, respiration is 18. Left ankle is warm, swollen, and passive range of motion. Phyllis is pain. Knees are mildly tender, palpation bilaterally, but do not have patients who are very active. Um, knee range of motion uh, is decrepitous bilaterally. The major exam is normal. On which the thesis of left <coughs> the ankle is performed and yields three holy The synovial fluid leukocyte count is 75,000, 92% neutrophils. Polarized light microscopy of the fluid shows no crystals. Gram stain is negative. Culture results are pending. What's the most likely? So 75,000 is very abnormal. Mm -hmm. You see that, like, you say, like, holy moly, what's going on in here? And then, like, a neutrophilic predominance. So we always do the polarized light microscopy just to look at the negatively or positively very refringent crystals, either gout or pseudogout, I have a slide later. Um, and the gram stain, sometimes we don't see the organisms, but having a negative gram stain doesn't mean you don't have an infection or a septic joint. But what do you think this person had? Like pretty severe inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. I would think septic arthritis. Septic arthritis. Right. If you guys end up in the urgent care, this is how you can get in trouble. You do not want to miss septic arthritis because it's a disaster. Those patients have permanent joint damage and they can even die. Um, so this one is actually a similar question but showing that the synovial fluid is only 3200. And then when you look at the polarized light, you see the rhomboid shape weakly positively birefringent crystals. You guys know what that is? Which one? Pseudogout. Calcium periphosphate. So, the the remember the thing to remember is that the the um, gout. Have you ever seen crystals? Gout crystals ever? Okay, so they're pretty good. I do it because I do. I spin down the urine on the patient with acute renal failure, and I look at the microscope. They're very. Just imagine, like you can see like little um, rhomboid shape as well, but you see a lot of like needles. Um, and uh, they're negatively bioprefringent. And this is, this is actually a slide, just to remind you that if you see anything greater than 50,000, that boy, that's very abnormal. You need to call an orthopedics for, for like urgent consultation. And uh, whereas in the, in the non-inflammatory arthritis, they're just the DJDs, degenerative joint disease, you only see a little bit of a white blood cell and you actually, it's a pretty, we call it a bland, pretty bland uh, tap. Whereas patients with RA, they can have, like, it can be, you can actually mix or confuse this one with a, with a, with a septic joint, but anything greater than 50,000 is pretty concerning. Or if you're approaching 50,000, you better, you know, you better call a consultant because that, that, that needs to be seen by a specialist. Okay, so this is a very long question. So this person has lupus, and I'm gonna go over the differential because uh, are you guys still use the MD soap or what's the name of that mnemonic that they use for lupus? You guys have a mnemonic? Uh, no. Mailer rash, discoid, yeah. MD. I when I was when I was in my old days it was MD soap, MD brain soap. You guys have used any mnemonics for lupus? Yeah. Which one? No. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, the key thing is that you need to have four or more, four out of um, 11, 11 criteria. Um, so there is mucocutaneous, organ systemic criteria, and the lab value. Lupus is the great mimicker. I've been burned by lupus many times in a way that I didn't think a patient had lupus and like I tell you, just today I had a patient with a renal biopsy and he's saying he's negative. I failed because I never sent an anti-RMP like, um, like in Smith. Those are like more, like newer antibodies but I never send it because I don't want to send a million dollar workup in a patient that I, you know, it's very rare to have ANA negative lupus. That's the take home message. 
You can have positive ANA for many reasons, but ANA negative lupus is rare. So, but the important things to remember is like you, you have patients have photosensitivity, they can have a rash, malar rash, the ulcerations can happen in the mouth, genitals, or nasopharynx. Um, and the discoid rash, there's some patients when they have like, like discoid lupus, which is a limited form of lupus uh, involving the skin, but it can also be seen in systemic lupus. And organ can affect pretty much everything. It can give you arthritis, which is, remember, non-erosive. Always remember that. If they give you an x-ray and you see erosion, that's not, that's not lupus. That may be an infection, or that may be RA, but it's not lupus. Um, that can give you cirrhosis, uh, uh, pleurisy, or pericarditis. In my patients um, that I get to interact with, I, they present with red blood cells in the urine. We call those acanthocytes. Acanthocytes is just the Mickey Mouse cells. It's red blood cells that have been deformed when they go through the glomeruli, and they actually look very dysmorphic on the, um, you know, when I do like a analysis of the urine sediment, and that's pathognomonic of, that's actually indicative of glomerular hematuria. You know, hematuria can go from anywhere in the urinary tract, from the kidneys, to the uterus, to the prostate, to the bladder, so on and so forth, urethra. But if on your boards they tell you that you see acanthocytes or that you actually see dysmorphic RBCs, they use the word dysmorphic more than acanthocytes. But if you see dysmorphic RBCs, that's glomerular hematuria until proven otherwise and those patients need a renal biopsy if, they, if, they're, if it's not contraindicated. So, and then we have, um, um, in hematology it's crazy, you know, I've seen like hemolytic anemias or maybe one line of cytopenia, either uh, thrombocytopenia or leukopenia, um, but these patients can present with a lot of blood, blood abnormalities and neuropsychiatric features. I told you about that patient that he got admitted because his personality was changing, he was crouching like crazy. So the guy had lupus. And the lab value criteria, we have um, the ANA, but we also have other antibodies that are associated with lupus. Um, there's one called the anti-double-stranded DNA. That is actually very commonly seen in patients with lupus nephritis. So that's one of the tests that I ordered for surveillance of my patients when they get successfully treated and I, I'm making surveillance. I always throw a double-stranded DNA along with the complement levels uh, just to see if there's any complement consumption or if there's any um, activity for the double-stranded DNA. And the other two is the anti-RNP in Smith. That's a much more specific. So I don't think, I'm going to ask my rheumatology friend, but I don't think there's such a thing as having a lupus with a negative ANA and a negative anti-RNP in Smith. So that's, that's actually more a step beyond that you can order. And or the patients can present with any of the features from the anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome. Have you guys heard about that anti-phospholipid? So in your board, it may present like a woman trying to get pregnant and having like recurrent miscarriages. So that's, that's one thing. Or patients can actually present with arterial thrombosis, which is very rare. Or patients with, I've had, in my practice, I've two patients coming to me with massive renal infarctions that came out of the blue without AFib. Like that's an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome until proven otherwise. But patients with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can actually present as a separate entity or it can be one of the manifestations of lupus. So when you see that, you think about lupus and you need to rule out lupus. But these patients clearly have a they have a very clear indication to have uh, chronic um, lifetime anticoagulation because they can they can present with like massive life-threatening thrombosis like distal arterial thrombosis and, and like I've seen crazy crazy cases with this antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Okay, so like I said, the ANA is sensitive, but it's not specific, um, and the anti-Smith is 100% specific. For disease activity, complement and double strand the DNA. Um, so this is this gets a little more complicated. Um, I have a slide that is very dense, and maybe you need it for step three. Maybe you guys PA. I don't think you're gonna need that much of knowledge from these rheumatologic diseases. They're 
they're they're frustrating to diagnose and not even an internal medicine we always think that like you know what you you put a name and a last name because there there are a lot of overlap symptoms from this condition but in a nutshell if you have antismic it's lupus if you have an anti-rmp you can actually have lupus or you can have an entity called mixed connective tissue disease those patients present with an overlap of lupus symptoms but they also they can have like um, a lot of like cutaneous involvement um, same thing with um, the anti-SSA and SSB. We see that in chagrins, but we also see like uh, um, we see it in like lupus um, limited to the skin, skin limited lupus. Uh, antiphospholipid antibody, I already told you, is lupus, uh, or it can be just antiphospholipid antibody itself. And on your boards, if they give you a question of a patient taking either hydralazine, procainamide, or isoniazid. Um, that's drug in this lupus and the antibody is called the antihistamine antibody. So that's common, common on your board. I got it twice on my board, so I, I want to make sure you guys remember that one. Okay? So this is a dense question to make it easier to remember so we can talk about fun things at the end. Um, this person is admitted with lupus and you can see that she's in really bad shape because look at the kidney function, the creatinine is 3.2 and you have a lupus anticoagulant positive and sh this person has basically like severe manifestations from the lupus anticoagulant and the question that I'm asking you is like which of the following is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient and the answer is heparin if you end up getting a patient with lupus with positive anti like 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 these are these are things that can save someone's life. If you miss the, that part, the patient is presented with like a thrombotic manifestation. They can have, they can have systemic coagulation and patients die. So always remember that's the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Okay. So it's important to determine if there is neurological or renal manifestation because the treatment is very different. If if the treatment of the kidney is antiphospholipid, I need to anticoagulate. If it's from lupus, I need to hit them with heavy immunosuppression. That's why for me, maybe for you guys it's not as important, but for me and my practice is very important that I make that distinction. Okay, so <coughs> let me remember this question. So Okay. Okay, so this person has Sjogren's disease. What is the most appropriate treatment? No. So she has okay. So this is actually lupus examination. No, this is C three, C four, A and A titer. Yeah, this is lupus. The key thing to understand and to remember is that plaquenil is very is a very safe drug. You need. <laughs> you need to have an eye exam every year. I remember I told you that. And it's a very safe medicine in pregnancy. You're going to be seeing a lot of uh, pregnant patients on Plaquenil because that's the only thing that actually can help during pregnancy. And if that doesn't help, they need to be on prednisone. But prednisone can be associated with what complication in pregnancy? Do you guys remember? Small, Small babies. Yeah, intra intrauterine growth retardation. Oh. Yeah, that's, the, that's one of the side effects. Okay, so for basically for just those patients that are having a lot of joint manifestations, we treat them with Plaquenil, you give them NSAIDs if they don't have a contraindication. What are the absolute contraindications for NSAIDs, guys? What else? Renal failure. Renal kidney disease in general, don't, don't prescribe. You're gonna get an angry nephrologist calling you, where are you doing <laughs> NSAIDs to my patients? What else? Severe heart failure, you don't want to give NSAIDs because these patients have decreased renal perfusion and if you give them NSAIDs, they're going to go into irreversible renal failure. In, at UCLA, at the CCU, they have a, one of the attendants, probably like a pretty bitter attending, put a little like a sign in the, in the entrance of the CCU. Uh, it says, in this unit, we don't prescribe NSAIDs. If you don't know the reason, ask your attending. So, you know, if you inhibit prostaglandins, you're effectively killing 
those kidneys because you're compromising the natural vasodilator of the kidney, which is the prostaglandin. <coughs> but severe heart failure, renal disease, like even if it's stage three, try to stay away from that. Uncontrolled hypertension, very commonly missed. Doctors prescribe this like candy if your patient is hypertensive. Don't give them NSAIDs. they are going to make them more hypertensive. Um, and for some patients with severe asthma, they can, they can actually get worse when you prescribe NSAIDs. And, like I already mentioned earlier, the elderly. You know, you, it's not FDA approved. You can use it with caution, but it's not FDA approved, so you can get in trouble. Okay, so... Um, if you have, like, lupus with kidney involvement, we use cytotoxic agents like cyclophosphamide, like I told you earlier, and steroids. And if you have, if you want to stay away from steroids, we use Imuran or we use Celsept or uh, Cytoxin. But before these medications were created, patients with lupus had a very limited life expectancy. And after the INH introduced these protocols with cytoxin in the 1980s, we were very successful treating this condition and lupus can actually go into full remission and it's a lifelong battle. I have a lot of young female patients seeing me because they have lupus nephritis and I, I, I do surveillance for you know disease activity but the good news is that most patients I'm, I'm able to successfully treat them and induce remission. The treatment is, is actually pretty aggressive because I'm giving cytotoxic therapy. Cytoxin is it's a pretty aggressive medication that have a lot of side effects. So when they're getting treated, they're all freak out because you're giving them high steroids, so they gain weight. There's a lot of changes in their body. Uh, they lose they lose their hair. Cytoxin can actually cause alopecia as a side effect. Um, all of these medications have a lot of side effects, so it's very challenging. The first six months, I always try to tell them from the beginning, this is bad, you're going to feel bad, but you need to eat right, you need to exercise. Because a lot of the times, patients that are taking steroids, if they don't take care of themselves, they gain weight dramatically. This medication really makes you makes you eat. And you know, a lot of them, they end up with steroid-induced diabetes. So, um, But the take-home message is lupus only in the joints. Um, you treat them with plaquenil. Lupus with severe involvement in the brain or in the kidneys, you need to do um, immunosuppression. And sometimes lupus can have like severe manifestations, like there is a condition called uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. The patients can actually present like 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 coughing up like hemoptysis, like severe hemoptysis. Sometimes those patients are so sick that they need to get plasma freeze, they need to get plasma exchange to remove all those pathogenic antibodies. But lupus is a, it's a difficult disease and especially in my field it makes it very difficult because I get involved in very dramatic cases when they call me to participate in, in pregnancy and there's a lot of emotions and there's always concern about how the outcome of the baby is going to be. So yeah, let me tell you that um, Maggie, right? Mm -hmm. Maggie, do you want to do OB? Okay. Pretty stressful. Pretty. It's a pretty stressful field. It's beautiful. I love it. I loved it when I did it. But it's pretty stressful. Because you're dealing with, you know, a lot of the times you're fine. But you just need one or two patients to drive you crazy. And every time I got a case, a case with that I'm involved in pregnancy, it's pretty challenging. Because the outcomes may not be always the best. All right. But I'm not, I'm not discouraging you. I think it's beautiful, <laughs> but it's stressful. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what this dude has. Um, it's legging. So, two weeks history of pleurisy, chest pain. Um, you can see the labs, tighter. Of the ANA, so lupus, chest x ray. Okay, which of the following confirm the most likely diagnosis? I already told you if you suspect lupus. Oh, this person, you don't need to know about this. This is, this is actually mixed connective tissue disease. Um, it's very complicated. It's a, not fun. Things that you need to know is that if you have Sjogren syndrome, you have a very high risk of developing lymphoma. Always remember that, lymphoma, if you have Sjogren syndrome. And if you have mixed connective tissue disease, they have good prognosis, they respond to the steroids, but they have 
it's like a lupus like syndrome but they have a lot of like myositis and they can even evolve to look like scleroderma have you guys heard about scleroderma they get a lot of like like very thick pain. you know have you guys heard about the crest syndrome i have a slide for that later okay so let me see four months progress fatigue yeah complete blood count and so right ventricular hypertrophy trade. this person has a um, yeah, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this is a complication of um, a lot of the um, mixed connective tissue disease rheumatology. So this person probably has systemic sclerosis. So the, the, the things that you need to know for your boards, this is complicated, but the things that you need to remember is that if you have a scleroderma renal crisis, the treatment is ACE inhibitor. You know, like if you don't give an ACE inhibitor, this patient are gonna go into, into irreversible renal failure. It's a renin dependent disease, so you want to treat it. <clears throat> I have a patient that every time he sees me, he reminds me that the nephrologist missed the diagnosis, and that's the reason why his wife lo he lost his wife to renal failure. So I hope I never miss something like this, but it can happen. And also, if you ever see the watermelon stomach, have you ever seen pictures of a watermelon stomach? Especially, they may show you one on the boards. So if they give you a watermelon stomach, you think about scleroderma until proven otherwise. Search the web for watermelon stomach picture. Here are some images of watermelon. This probably looks like. Oh, oh from the inside. Yeah, that. <laughs> it's like a gastric and enteral vascular station. It's uh, this is the watermelon stomach. If they give you that, you think about that. But this is a very complex thing, like you know, the crest, calcinosis, Raynaud's, lower esophageal dysfunction, sclerodactylia, and telangiectasias. So it's the crest syndrome, and you can have like systemic sclerosis, either diffuse. Uh, for systemic sclerosis, the prognosis is actually those are the diseases that. They haven't really done a lot of uh, improvement, especially for those patients that develop like like pulmonary fibrosis and irreversible renal failure. Um, but important things for you guys to know, to remember for your boards, the scleroderma renal crisis. I'm sorry, scleroderma renal crisis, you treat with an ACE inhibitor, watermelon stomach, you think about um, um, systemic sclerosis, and remember the crest, the pentad, and yeah, the treatment is just not, when these patients develop interstitial lung disease, it's just really bad. I mean, they, they, they progress. There's no effective treatment for these patients. Okay. So, Wegeners, we don't call it Wegeners anymore. You guys know? Uh, you're going to see it. I actually, I'm so happy that I found, I was moonlighting a month ago at the Pasadena Urgent Care, uh, Kaiser, and <clears throat> I had a 32-year-old male coming in with multiple bouts of sinusitis and prior that year he was treated with tubes by the ENT doctor because he had severe otitis. If you have an adult with recurrent otitis, that patient either has a structural abnormality or that person has or is a smoker or that person has an underlying small vessel vasculitis. And I was so glad that, that I, I was able to diagnose him because for many years he was treated for sinusitis and otitis and everything so I, I noticed that the guy was now having not joint pains and the guy was also, I did a CT of the sinuses and he had like pan sinusitis. I mean the whole maxillary sinus is occupied and the whole ethmoidal sinus is occupied. You see that if you have HIV or if you're immunocompromised or if you have like something that is non-infectious. So I called the ENT doctor, and the ENT doctor told me, like, no, just give him prednisone and treat him with uh, fluoroquinolone for 21 days. Just send me a referral. I'm going to see him in clinic. Before I let him go, I ordered an ANCA, and it turned out that the guy has ANCA. And I'm so glad because the guy, you know, this is a disease that goes unrecognized for months and years. I have five dialysis patients with ANCA, with uh, GPA, and they had similar stories. They were not recognized or identified on time. And it's a nasty disease in the kidneys. These patients progress very quickly. Remember we talked about RPGNs the other day? 
we talk about RPGN, right, with you guys? Yeah, so RPGNs, um, these patients can go from having normal renal function to being dialysis dependent within two months when there's renal involvement. So the take home message for you guys is that Wegener's, we no longer call it Wegener's, GPF, granulomatosis with polyangitis, it's a small vessel vasculitis that is part of the family, the ANCA, ANCA associated small vessel vasculitis. We call it ANCA because it's an anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. Um, and then there's two components of the test. Number one, you need to have the, the, the anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. And then the second component of the test is that they do it under immunofluorescence. They look at the pattern. And if the pattern is perinuclear, we call those p -anca. If the pattern is more like a centromere or cent central, we call those c -anca. And the c -anca is more likely associated with Wegener's. And the p -anca is more likely associated with MPA. So that's the way I remember when I was doing my fellowship. I was like, oh, c -anca. what the hell is that? C -anca. So c -anca, Wegener's, P is perinuclear, MPA has a P, so that's how I remember. Um, I don't think you need to know this for your boards, but what I want you to remember always from now on for the rest of your practice, if you have a patient with recurrent otitis, you may you may make a big difference in that person's life if you are able to diagnose them. So just think about ANCA as a simple test, you send it, an ANCA test. Okay? So, oh, PMR. PMR is another thing that you're gonna see in the urgent care, no matter where you go. These patients, they can't even stand up. They're very stiff, and they have a lot of um, proximal muscle weakness and pain. And one of the things that makes them feel better, and the, the improvement is quite dramatic, is when you start them on prednisone. You give them 60 milligrams, like usually one milligram per kilogram. And the next day, they're, they're so grateful. They, they call you, send you messages. Thank you very much. For your boards, the disease association that I don't want you to miss is that um, these patients can get, um, how do you call that, involvement of the temporal artery and they can get temporal arthritis and that can be associated with blindness, like permanent damage. So on your boards, they, the answer may be if they tell you what is the next step in the management, you know, is a temporal artery biopsy or yeah, I mean, that's usually the answer. You're not going to do the biopsy, but that's usually the answer. But um, this person basically was failing stero steroids, and if the steroid didn't do it, the next step for this patient is to add methotrexate. But that's not usually the case. Most patients with PMR, they respond, and they get, they get, they get better quickly after you give them the steroids. So, oh, I'm sorry. So this person... This example is a person with um, basically um, so this person has renal artery stenosis from uh, vasculitis. So renal artery stenosis on your boards. They, there's two types. One is the most common one, which is the atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Is atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis is an old person's disease. Either you're old or you have a familial hyperlipidemia or you have um, um, a, a reason for having accelerated atherosclerosis. A perfect example is the patients with nephrotic syndrome. You guys remember when you pee a lot of albumin? the liver enzymes, they get upregulated and they start producing a lot of cholesterol. So that's one of the complications of nephrotic syndromes. They develop accelerated atherosclerosis. So the typical atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis is a disease that involves the, the proximal third of the renal arteries. Just envision like a plaque of cholesterol from the aorta extending into the renal arteries. That way you remember atherosclerotic is the proximal third. And we have the, the, the other type of um, uh, renal artery stenosis is the fibromuscular dysplasia. The fibromuscular dysplasia most of the time is a young female with secondary hypertension and usually it's a genetic disease. They actually have like a, this, this dysplasia 
of the distal renal artery causing severe hypertension but you also see renal uh, distal renal artery stenosis not only from fibromuscular dysplasia but you can also see that in patients when they're for instance cancer survivors status post XRT to the abdomen patients can can actually develop that as a complication or patients with vasculitis you can get like renal artery stenosis so there is um, a slide that I I included here is a very complex topic in medicine I, I'm not going to cover everything because it's beyond the, the, the purpose of this talk but the things that you need to remember is if you have um, small vasculitis more commonly tested in the board is the ANCA so you already know the MPA the church trials and the drug induced um, and you can get an ANCA negative either the patients have leukocytoclastic or HSP, henna shell and purpura. Uh, you guys, I mean, you're gonna get a lot of questions on peats. It's commonly seen in peats. They have like this salmon, salmon color rash in the lower extremities. And to remember from the large vessel vasculitis is the, the polymyalgia rheumatica. This is the one that can actually give you the temporal, you know, temporal arthritis and can cause blindness. Giant cell arthritis, I've never seen one, but I, I, I don't even remember getting a question. This one is heavily tested on the boards. And the reason why it's because you're gonna be taking care of kids. And for those kids that keep coming back to the urgent care, that they actually have like uh, uh, mucositis or like conjunctivitis and they, nothing is really growing either in the viral panel. I mean, you, can, you don't really have a source of the fever. Um, you need to identify this um, Takayasus because these kids can actually get um, aneurysms of the coronary arteries and they can die. And um, that's, that's actually the most common, is one of the most common causes of malpractice in peds. Because in pediatrics, we're used to, you know, like, oh, it's a virus, you know, just come back. But be aware that if the kids is having fever with other manifestations, like I just said, mucositis or uh, conjunctivitis, you have to rule that out. And the way you rule it out, there's a diagnostic criteria. I haven't done PEATS for a long time, but one of the tests you do is ESR, CRP. You know, you do the blood counts. And if you suspect that you need to start treating them right away with steroids, otherwise they, they can have irreversible damage. Okay. This is an even more complex. I'm gonna leave it for your review. This is basically the, the ANCAS. Uh, but the, in red, I put the more the more important things, the more relevant things that you need to know. So GPA, it's respiratory tract and the kidneys. Sometimes these patients can present with what we call as a pulmonary renal syndrome. Have you guys ever heard about that? Pulmonary renal syndrome. So this, there's three diseases that can actually present, three rheumatologic diseases that can present involving simultaneously the lungs and the kidneys. And every time that that happens is a disaster because these patients a lot of times they end up going into respiratory failure and they get very sick in the ICU. So they, I'm going to name them. One is the ANCA, associated vasculitis, which can either be a GPA or, or a uh, microscopic polyangitis as well, or even the short straws, the eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. And the second one is a condition called um, you're probably going to get tested on this condition. It's called good posture syndrome, and good posture syndrome is an is an autoantibody against the glomerular basement membrane. And these patients can be. It's important that if they, if they show you that question on the boards, um, they may ask you. They already probably know that you know what good posture is in the kidney and the lungs, but they, they're going to ask you what is the next step in the management. And the next step in the management when you suspect good postures is plasmapheresis. If you don't plasmapheresis these patients, they go down, they, they never come back. They, they get progressively sicker and sicker. You dialyze, and the last time I had a case like this, the patient, uh, he didn't have good postures, but he had cryo, I'm gonna show you about cryoglobulinemia. The guy had skin, kidneys, lung involvement, and he went into really bad respiratory failure. I plasmapheresis him. The guy was in the ventilator for six days. He was not getting better. I plasma exchanged the guy, and the next day we were able to extubate him. So that's it's just that dramatic. So on the boards, they always ask you questions about what is the best next step in the management for two conditions that they're heavily tested on the boards. One is called TTP, 
thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura. You know, there's a pentad of symptoms, fever, anemia, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal failure, and what's the other one? In the fever. All right, fever, thrombocytopenia, oh, and alter mental status. That's the pentad. I don't know if you remember for your board. The, for TTP. TTP, the next step in the management is plasmapheresis. Same thing as good postures, it's plasmapheresis. Okay? So, and the other condition is lupus. Lupus can attack the kidneys and the lungs at the same time. But if you remember the ANCAS, lupus, and the good postures, if you ever encountered that in your practice, you can save someone's life. Um, DAH is diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Remember, I told you this is a pretty dramatic thing. They, they do a pulmonary lavage, they do a bronchoscopy, and then they wash, they, they start actually washing, and one of the things the pulmonologists expect is that when they wash, the water that comes out, or the saline that comes out, is gonna be clear. So when, the, when patients, patients have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, they, the more they clean, the more water, the more blood they get, and it's pretty dramatic. So those patients can actually get very sick. So for Chuck, short straws that we don't call it anymore, it's not chuggies, I miss an R, it's short straws. It's asthma and they, they may have peripheral eosinophilia. And we also have the cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, which is most of the time is associated, you know, we have type one and type two. The type two is, most, is always associated with hepatitis C. These patients have palpable purpura. Palpable purpura, just imagine if you have a violaceous lesion that is raised and if they show you a rash, if you've never seen it, you should see it at least once because they may show you a picture on your voice. Search the web for... Um, <coughs> what? Search the web for palpable purpura picture. Here are some images of palpable purpura I found on the web. These are crusted already, but this is not the best picture, but these lesions are already crusted. Mm -hmm. So the patients with this type of involvement, they have like raised lesions. This is like more like a advanced process. It's already crusted, but if you see that, that's, that's pretty abnormal. That's actually a small vessel vasculitis until proven otherwise. And the last thing is that HSP can present in kids and adults, and in renal biopsy is indistinguishable, indistinguishable from a condition called IgA nephropathy, and it's the most common gene in the world. But these patients have good prognosis if you catch them on time, you treat them, and usually goes away. Okay, okay. So the I'm sorry. Did I tell you? Did I tell you one name for the? Actually, Takajasu is a big vessel. I'm sorry. The one that I want you to remember is Kawasaki. I don't want to confuse you. It's Kawasaki. I always confuse it because I don't see kids. I, that's why I wrote there. I don't need to know this, but you guys need to know this, especially if you're going to be doing family medicine. Kawasaki is the entity you cannot miss in children, and you're going to be tested on your course. So make sure you review that one. So for you guys, disease associations that you need to know is that there is a condition called polyarteritis nodosum, that's associated with hepatitis B. Uh, it's, a, it's a manifestation of hepatitis B. These patients can actually have fever, abdominal pain, arthralgia, and they actually have aneurysmal formation. If they show you a picture of a renal angiogram, and in the renal angiogram you see a bunch of aneurysms, that's PAN. Don't miss that one because I got it wrong on my boards. So PAN, it's a medium vessel vasculitis that um, it's the most common association is with hepatitis B infection. So um, you don't biopsy those patients. If you do a renal biopsy, if you hit one of those aneurysms, that's it. The patient will die from <laughs> unstoppable bleed unless they, they remove the kidney. Um, but um, the key thing to, to always remember for your boards is the disease association with hepatitis B. Okay. These are the large vessels. Um, in red, again, the giant cell arthritis, is visual loss is an emergency and these patients, they need like, steroids until the ESR normalizes. Um, for the PMR, they respond very quickly. Like I told you, these patients, if they, they're not getting better, you need to add methotrexate. For the Takajasu, is aorta and branches. And these patients can have like severe hypertension 
or they get muscular insufficiency, like when they walk, they have a lot of pain, or they, they can't walk. They, the muscles won't respond because they're not getting enough, enough perfusion. Okay, and this last slide, I took it from up to date. You guys, you guys use up to date a lot? I love up to date. So this last slide, I, I took it from up to date, and the reason why I put it there is because you need to have a systematic approach for every rheumatologic patient. So. The first thing you want to wonder, you want to get a good history from the patient. You identify if it's one joint or is more more than one joint. If you know like it's more than one joint, you want to establish duration of the symptoms, joints that are compromised, whether or not the patient has synovitis on your boards. It's always easy to deduct whether the patient is having synovitis. They're not going to fool you around. If they show you, if they tell you it's red and hot and warm that's synovitis, period. So it's very easy because if they have synovitis, um, you go into the inflammatory path. If they don't have synovitis, you go into, okay, does this patient have any tender points? If they have a lot of tender points, you're gonna diagnose them with fibromyalgia. Have you guys heard about fibromyalgia? Mm -hmm. So fibromyalgia, just to give you a little heads up, you're gonna see it a lot in your clinical practice. And unfortunately, it's a condition that is very difficult to treat and is very poorly understood. Some people think like, oh, this, they're just making up the symptoms. But there's a lot of research associating fibromyalgia with um, disrupted sleep cycle. Like this, this, in general, this patient has like a unifying common thing they have, they have is sleep deprivation. That's why sleep is so important. You know, you know when you're in med school, you don't sleep. In PA school, you don't sleep. But sleep is so important in life. And that's why you want to stay away from night shifts, Maggie? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we all suffer the night shift. I finally got rid of my night shifts. I get called once in a while, but that's okay. Like I used to do night shifts, it was horrible. So, um, but fibromyalgia is a clinical diagnosis. There is no specific test to diagnose this entity. You just basically, you do the, I think there are 18 different points, I think. They're in the back of the neck, I think the shoulders, the upper back, the sacral area, the eyes. Um, here I think there's another point. So there's 18 points if I'm not mistaken. You need to have like 12 out of 18. I, I can't remember what the diagnostic criteria is, but this is quite common. So when you see a patient and nothing makes sense, you start asking her about like, does this hurt, does this hurt, and then more likely you're gonna, you know, you do the tender point approach, you're gonna get to the diagnosis. So if they don't have any tender points, you think about, okay, this is like a little bit of a viral arthralgia if it's short-lived short versus osteoarthritis. Remember, there's no synovitis. It can, there, it can be, but it's not the general rule, and they're not going to trick you on your boards. Um, and then you think about like systemic diseases, like patients with undiagnosed or untreated hypothyroidism, they can present with joint pains. I don't know the physiopathology, but it's been very well described. Um, or the patients may have like some sort of neuropathic pain or pain that, you know, like a neuropathy or pain that follows one distribution that, that gets a little more complicated because you may be dealing with a peripheral neuropathy. Um, or the patients may have depression, you know, that may be just a manifestation of depression. And that's why they also theorize that patients with fibromyalgia is just a manifestation of depression. And they, they link all the three things. The treatment of fibromyalgia, and always, I want you guys to always remember this, involves exercise, restoring the sleep cycle, physical therapy, maybe uh, chronic pain medications like, um, you know, like the anti anticonvulsant medications like gabapentin or Lyrica. It works pretty well for that. And never involves the use of opiates. Never involves the use of opiates. So if you have a fibromyalgia patient and you're giving them opiates, that's not practice. You're doing a disservice to your patient because you're not curing anything. You're only making things worse. And then for the other testing that you consider, if you don't see any, any synovitis, you think about serologies, you think about, you know, is this TSH or, you know, liver problems. But, you know, it's, it's, it's usually, most of the times it's fibromyalgia or some sort of like osteoarthritis, period. Those are probably the two biggest differential. If you have synovitis, then you want to establish how long has this been going on for. If it's more than six weeks, you think about systemic rheumatologic diseases. If it's less than six weeks, it's either a systemic rheumatologic disease that is too early to diagnose, 
or some sort of viral. So you just follow them, you give them treatment, you give them a little bit of uh, insight, return precautions, you can bring them back, and you can order the workup. I usually order the workup when I see them, you know, I order like the hepatitis B and C and the parvovirus serology, and I do a blood count and LFTs just to rule out hepatitis. Um, and most of these patients at three months, they should not have any pain if it's viral related. But if you're dealing with a systemic rheumatologic disease, then you can go that path. My advice to you, like I told you earlier, is don't order a lot of ANA. Only order ANA for those patients with clear evidence of synovitis. Synovitis, I'm sorry. Or even if you don't see it on exam, if the patient is reliable and dependable, you know how sometimes you see patients that you've never seen before and for some reason you believe in more than others. And it's just like your, your common sense or your gut and you develop that with, with experience after talking and interviewing many, many patients throughout your life. But if you are going to investigate, I do it on those patients that I really suspect that the history is very legit and they've had symptoms long enough to consider the possibility of them having rheumatologic disease. So I do a CBC, ESR, rheumatoid factor, anti-PCP, and ANA, and I check renal function, especially if you're going to give them ster uh, NSAIDs. If, you're, if, you, if you see a patient in the urgent care and you don't see that you don't have a creatinine value, don't give them NSAIDs because you don't know. You never know. I have a patient once that he came his chief complaint was gout, and he got treated at this same urgent care repeatedly with indomethacin, and he never had laps. He came to all of you, I was on call that night, he came to all of you, a guy was in full-blown renal failure, and gout is usually a manifestation of renal failure, or advanced kidney disease, because the kidneys inability to clear the uric acid and with subsequent deposition of uric acid crystals. So if you have a patient with gout, you can still make the clinical diagnosis, and I think it's okay to treat them. You know, in, in the, the, the right answer for a medical board question is you always need to diagnose them with a diagnostic arthrocentesis. You need to tap the joint and you need to look at the crystals. In real life, we don't do it because I don't know how to, I don't know how to tap the first metatarsal joint or the hallux. Imagine how painful that is, stick a needle there, and I'm not gonna do a dry tap and torture this guy, and if I'm pretty confident with my skills like this is gout, I just go ahead and treat it. But for the sake of your boards, when you have a monoarticular arthritis, you always tap. You always tap and you always make the diagnosis based on, on what you find. But, um, but the reality is that in clinical practice, we oftentimes we just treat them. And so going back to this individual, he was never, his kidney function was never checked and he came with a creatinine of 20, full-blown renal failure and blah, 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 and dialysis dependent. Um, but it's not rocket science, it's a little annoying to think about all these things, but if you do this approach, you're going to do fine. And the same thing for your boards. Think about what is it that they're asking me? Are they asking me about an inflammatory process or is this, this is a synovitis? or this is not synovitis. If it's not synovitis, you already know you go that path. And if it's synovitis, you need to understand duration and monoarticular versus polyarticular. And also for the boards, always remember, you cannot miss a septic joint. That's my practice. IV drug use, patients with some sort of like hardware from prior open reduction and internal fixation, um, patients with you know, even patients with uh, sickle cell crisis, because those, those sickle cell patients, they actually, they can that very frequently develop uh, staph aureus bacteremia, and they can actually seed the joints and they can develop like septic joints. So those patients with septic joints, they usually have a history of trauma or some predisposing condition, like an underlying either immunodeficiency or the examples that I just described. Okay, that's the last slide, I think. Okay, what time is it? You guys have questions?